On this Tuesday night, a 5 a.m. phone call with a historic surprise. This is an important call from Sweden. You must stay on the line. Please stay on the line while we transfer the call. And then I stayed on the line for over 15 minutes because I am a rule follower. Um, <laughs> the first Canadian woman to win the Nobel Prize in physics, and it's for work that may have changed your life. So are we doing enough to encourage other young women in science? Also tonight, a seismic shift in Quebec and the extraordinary step the next premier says he will take to protect secularism. And the final countdown to the U.S. midterms, we go in depth. What's at stake and why Canadians should be paying attention? This is The National. Her work with lasers has improved countless people's eyesight in an instant, and you've probably never heard of her. Well, now it's Donna Strickland's life that's changed in an instant. The Canadian scientist is the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in physics in half a century, just the third woman ever to be so honoured. And as Ron Charles tells us, this has made her a sudden celebrity. This is not the kind of reception Donna Strickland is used to in her laser lab at the University of Waterloo. Rock star treatment for an associate physics professor who happens to have just won a Nobel Prize. That win came as such a surprise to Strickland that when the Nobel Committee called her at 5 this morning, she hung up on them after they put her on hold. And then I said, there's got to be something wrong, so we did hang up. But, but my husband and I discussed this a long time, like, how long am I supposed to hang on? And then I kept saying, this would really be a cruel prank if this is just somebody pranking me. After an email and a callback, Strickland learned she would be sharing the prize for her postdoctoral thesis published more than 30 years ago. Somebody from the Nobel Prize, think, they think it's the first time ever that someone got it for their very first paper. Um, so over the years when I've met people, they have said, you know, haven't you got that Nobel Prize yet? But I always thought they were kidding with me. The discovery for which Strickland and her thesis supervisor Gerard Moreau won the prize is called chirped pulse amplification. It led to significantly more powerful and precise lasers that were also smaller, allowing, for one thing, safe laser eye surgery that has corrected the vision of millions of people worldwide. Students already inspired by Strickland's work are thrilled. It's used in almost every laser today. I don't know if people know that. And so she, she could have made a lot of money if she had patented it, let's say, but uh, she chose not to, uh, being the scientist that she is. And uh, I think that's honorable. And, and she's, it's paid off for her. She's won the Nobel Prize. When the question came up of whether the university's first Nobel Prize laureate should be given a full professorship, the school's president said she will still have to go through the process, but... I told her that she doesn't have to submit a very long CV. One line will be sufficient. Strickland's planning to pick up her prize in December. Ron Charles, CBC News, Waterloo, Ontario. Before Donna Strickland, the last woman to win the Nobel Prize in physics was Maria Gapert Meyer in 1963. She advanced the understanding of atoms. The only other woman is a name you might recognize, Marie Curie, in 1903 for pioneering research on radioactivity. Curie also won the Nobel for chemistry in 1911 for discovering radium. So just three women out of more than 200 people to receive the physics prize since it was first awarded more than a century ago. Why the gender gap? Is there hope for change? The CBC's Kayla Hounsell has that angle tonight. Safir Kaur, Doctor of Philosophy in Physics. To accept a PhD in physics on the day Donna Strickland wins a Nobel Prize is something special. It feels like so great. It's like a wonderful day for women, I would say. I've been in the male-dominated field all through my academic career. But Dalhousie professor Sarah Wells says she's personally experienced sexism in science. I think in order to stay in this field and success, you kind of have to just put it aside and just shrug. That sexism appears to be alive and well. Recently, Italian professor Alessandro Strumia sparked outrage when he said that physics was invented and built by men and that women are actually being hired over men who are more qualified. He made the comments at a workshop organized by CERN, a world-leading physics lab in Switzerland. I think that they're from a place of academic jealousy. Dr. Jessica Wade was at that gathering. And I think that we just need 
to get to a stage where young scientists, if they're feeling that they're being bullied and if they're feeling that they're not being treated well, can stand up and can speak out and can get the support that they need. Professor Sarah Wells says she's not surprised by Strumia's comments. She also says efforts to attract more women to the field need to start earlier because young girls are often dropping math and science before they get through high school. That leaves them ineligible for some university courses. But she says even those who do pursue science often go unseen. Even behind a lot of the previous Nobel Prizes in physics, there were lots of women working behind the scenes, sometimes in very key roles, and then were not recognized uh, for their work. On the other hand, 29-year-old Satbir Kaur says she has never experienced sexism in the lab. Well, I think now that times are changing, women are coming forward, and in future we hope we get many more Nobel Prizes. Hope for future academics trying to make their way in the field of science. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Here's a look at what else we're working on tonight on The National. Calgary hasn't seen this much snow this early in decades. Now they're calling on Edmonton to help. And should Donald Trump have veto power over Canada's trade agreements? We'll take a closer look at part of the new trade deal with the U.S. and Mexico. First, though, Quebec's new majority government and a new political era. We want to establish good relationship with the different uh, groups representing the Anglophones. It's important uh, that we reassure uh, the Anglophone community. Quebec's next premier, François Legault, reaching out to English speakers after last night's landslide election victory for the Coalition Avenir Québec. Sovereignty is no longer top of mind for the former Parti Québécois cabinet minister. Now he has a pro-business, pragmatic vision for Quebec's future. But he's also promising big changes to immigration and religious freedoms, things that became flashpoints in his rise to power. But it's not just the tone that Legault is striking on secular nationalism. We've heard versions of that before. It's how he plans to bring about change. Our Jayla Bernstein looks at what's different this time. He's not even premier yet, but already François Legault is flexing one of the most powerful political tools at a province's disposal. The CAQ wants to ban people in authority, like police officers and teachers, from wearing religious symbols. And today, Legault said he was ready to override the charter to do it. If we have to use the notwithstanding clause to apply what wants, the majority of Quebecers will do so. Legault's also promising to cut the province's immigration quota next year from 50,000 people to 40,000. That might sit well in Quebec's regions, but not so much in Montreal. The diverse city was an exception to the CAQ's blue wave. Immigrants are welcome. Uh, it's good for um, our society. It's good for our culture. It's good for the workforce. It's good on so many levels. So I will, uh, I will continue to protect the welcoming side of Montreal. Though Quebec's next premier has some polarizing ideas, he says he's ready to work with all Quebecers. I'm a pragmatic guy. Uh, we are a pragmatic uh, party. The businessman turned politician says his top priorities are putting more money back into the pockets of Quebecers, decentralizing health care and opening it up to the private sector, and scrapping school boards for something he calls more efficient. The CAQ is a shift to the right for Quebec politics, though conservative is a relative term. François Legault is no Doug Ford. He's no Andrew Scheer. He's, he's not from, 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 that, uh, uh, from, from that ideology. So, uh, for example, he has no problem with the carbon tax, which seems to be the big divide between conservatives and others in this country. Certainly not everyone in Quebec supports Legault's policies, but voters had their say when they gave him an overwhelming majority, and with that, a four-year mandate. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Quebec City. And there is another big question in all of this. How will Legault's big win affect the federal political picture? Because things have changed since Justin Trudeau came to power when he faced a generally friendlier situation across the country. Consider this. Less than three short years ago, October 2015, Liberals governed Canada's three largest provinces, B.C., Ontario, and Quebec, and all of Atlantic Canada, too, by the way, with the exception of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today, the political landscape looks dramatically different. B.C. has gone NDP. Manitoba went the other way from left to right. The Liberals have been shattered in both Ontario and Quebec, and 
Even the Atlantic red stronghold is showing at least one crack. They could lose New Brunswick to the progressive conservatives after that province's razor thin election result last week. A different political ball game for sure. So how might Trudeau play it? Well, here's our national affairs editor, Chris Hall. So Chris, what does this big shift mean for the prime minister? Well, Andrew, it means that Justin Trudeau loses a valuable ally at the federal provincial table. And Francois Legault opens up issues that he hasn't had to confront with the provincial premiers on immigration, limiting the number of people into the country and or into Quebec anyway, uh, threatening to expel those who don't learn French within three years, and certainly on dairy. Uh, the support for Legault's CAQ party comes primarily from francophone rural ridings, and they will be demanding that he step up and oppose some of the concessions made in the new NAFTA deal. So I suspect that will be the first place that they clash. And, and Chris, you know, even challenges on another front, I think of the federal opposition parties, does Legault's win open up opportunities for them? Yeah, for the Conservatives, they see a, a, a lot of victories here because CAQ has many of the similar issues, lower taxes on the immigration file. They would agree with that. Lots of Conservatives uh, had been involved in the CAQ campaign. Even for the New Democrats, the, the strong showing of Quebec Solidaire with its young supporters, with its stance uh, pro-environment, pro-social justice, they see opportunities here because that party won in ridings that are now held by the NDP in all but two cases fed, uh, federally in Quebec. So they see some gains potentially here for them as well. It's a different landscape, that's for sure. Our national affairs editor, Chris Hall in Ottawa. Thanks so much. Thanks. So Chris mentioned the new trade deal. NAFTA's replacement may make it harder for Canada to pursue deals with other countries such as China. Katie Simpson sorts through the fine print to explain why Donald Trump may have the final word in a Canadian deal. A new tool for the disruptor in chief. Donald Trump now has veto power over part of Canada's trade agenda because of a provision in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. There's a clause that aims to prevent free trade talks with China. Chapter 32 says if Canada, the U.S. or Mexico want to start free trade talks with a non-market or state-run economy, the other two partners must first approve or they can kill the USMCA. It is troubling to provide another country with a formal role in vetting Canadian trade negotiations. The Trump administration hates China's trading policies and is waging a tariff war to pressure its government into changing its ways. Chapter 32 is seen as part of that wider strategy. You know, the continent as a whole now stands united against what I'm going to call unfair trading practices by you-know-who. Starts with a C and it ends with an A. Canada? No. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Canada is now in an uncomfortable position. The Prime Minister wanted to strengthen ties with China and even traveled to Beijing last December in a failed attempt to launch free trade talks. Those efforts are not dead, he says, despite the provision. And we, as always, will look for ways to uh, engage, deepen and improve our trading relationship with them. Canadian canola farmers have serious questions about what this all means, since they say they could make up to a billion dollars more per year if they had free trade with their biggest customer. China's a really important market for us. We see an opportunity to grow in that market in the future. It's an opportunity they don't want to miss out on because of Donald Trump. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. The New Deal also means we'll see more American dairy products on store shelves, and that has some concern about bovine growth hormones. Right now, they're banned in Canada, but as Catherine Cullen explains, they pose more of a risk to cows than humans. Do we really know what's in our milk? Just because it says this, we heard there could also be this. I think it's important for people to know that, that, that almost all foods contain trace quantities of, of hormones or hormone-like compounds. With the new trade deal opening up Canada's market a bit more to some U.S. products. Including milk, butter, cheese, yogurt and ice cream, to name a few. Some people are wondering, do you have to worry about hormones in your milk? Or other dairy products for that matter? About one in five American dairy farms use a hormone called RBST, recombinant bovine somatotropin. They inject cows with it so they'll produce more milk. But BST isn't used in Canada. 
This doctor was part of the expert panel that recommended a BST ban back in 1999 over concerns about what it does to cows. Dr. Michael Pollack says it's a different story for people. It's been studied very carefully and there is no proof that it's dangerous, but it still remains a bit of a scientific controversy because it's impossible to rule out small, subtle effects. So if there's no proven threat, why the fuss? Am I playing Russian roulette with my family? Certainly, campaigns like this have raised questions. Fears around the use of BSD uh, have been overblown, uh, I suspect, and, and for for good reasons. Uh, obviously, we wanted to protect our market and we wanted to sell to Canadians that our practices are, are very strong and robust. But you still might be wondering, will I be able to tell if it's in my milk? You can tell if you're buying a Canadian product because it's branded like this. But there are still some calls for BST-specific labels for U.S. products. Should consumers know? Uh, I would say yes, absolutely, and let them decide. Even if there's no evidence, safety's an issue. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. It's all systems go for a new mega construction project in British Columbia, a liquefied natural gas venture with a whopping $40 billion price tag. We are united in acting to seize the generational opportunity to develop a new sector. It's made up of more than 600 kilometers of pipeline stretching to the coast, plus a terminal in Kitimat, all of it being built by a consortium of energy companies seeking the fastest route to Asia for North American natural gas. It has support from all levels of government and local First Nations, but as Greg Rasmussen tells us, it's not short on critics or controversy. Instead of the usual butting of heads, it was hugs, handshakes and smiles between the Prime Minister and BC's Premier. Today's announcement by LNG Canada represents the single largest private sector investment in the history of Canada. I like that sentence so much, I'm going to say it again. The single largest private sector... Trudeau says it will create 10,000 construction jobs and billions in new revenue to all levels of government. Welcome news in the small town of Kitimat on the province's north coast. I think that Kitimat is about to grow in a way that we've all really wanted to see it happen. It will transform the town, now just 8,000 people, with a pipeline, docks and huge specialized tankers to transport the gas. Unlike the proposed Trans Mountain oil pipeline, this gas project has the support of 25 First Nations. We've never been a part of any other opportunity such as, such as LNG Canada and this opportunity is huge when it comes to, to our way of life. Before the final thumbs up, BC will have to pass legislation, and the Green Party, which holds the balance of power, is slamming the project as unsustainable. If he's worried, BC's Premier wasn't showing it. And I'm fairly confident that partisan politics will not get in the way of the single largest private sector investment in Canadian history. Is that what it is? That's what it is. <laughs> Environmental groups, though, warn this isn't a laughing matter saying these signatures will lead to millions of tons of additional CO2 pouring into the skies. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, let's take you to Calgary now, where we are tracking an intense early season snowstorm. So much snow has fallen that the city says it just can't keep up. Um, I don't know. I don't know what we did, but Mother Nature's mad. <laughs> yeah, mad enough to cause this. A record-breaking, misery-making snowfall. Overnight, upwards of 40 centimeters fell. That's the most snow Calgary has seen this early in the season in nearly 60 years. And it came down so fast, so heavily, the roads were a nightmare. In just 12 hours, more than 250 collisions. 80 buses got stuck, and with so much snow still left to clear, the city decided today to call in reinforcements. We have resources on the road very soon, coming from Edmonton, uh, they're coming from Red Deer, Okotoks, uh, even as far down as Medicine Hat. So crews are headed in to help. Meanwhile, it's not much better outside the city. Earlier tonight, part of the Trans-Canada Highway near Canmore was closed, and we're getting reports of people trapped in their cars for hours because of those brutal conditions. 
We will be keeping a close eye on the storm all night live here on the National. And a little later, we'll hear more from folks on the ground about how they're dealing with all that snow. And just over one month now until America votes, our political insiders weigh in on what is really at stake in the U.S. midterms. First, though, in a few weeks, pot will be legal here in Canada, but will there be enough to go around? As a country, we don't have a shortage of marijuana. We have a shortage of legal marijuana. Canada has been working towards marijuana leg legalization for years. And with just 15 days left to go, you'd think everything would be ready. But there is already talk of a shortage. Diane Buckner has more on the disconnect between supply and demand. You've got pipes and, and water pipes and bongs, that sort of thing. Angus Taylor uh, has just about everything ready to roll at his cannabis retail outlet. Display cases, branding, plenty of paraphernalia, it all looks good. In the back, though, here, although you don't see any cannabis products right now, empty shelves await a first delivery. And what Taylor is hearing from suppliers is making him nervous. I've recently heard uh, comments from, from some of the CEOs saying that they don't uh, expect there to be enough product in the system. And uh, that, of course, is of great concern to us. Not enough product? Haven't cannabis companies been working overtime for months? We didn't have enough producers far enough ahead from legalization that they'll actually be able to deliver product to market by the time uh, legalization happens. Economist Rosalie Wanch has been studying cannabis producers' inventory reports, and she's analyzed how demand for legal cannabis played out in Colorado and Washington. Her view? There is not currently enough legal supply of marijuana to actually supply all of the recreational demand for marijuana in Canada. How much weed do we need? Estimates for the first year range from 600,000 to 926,000 kilograms. Meanwhile, the forecast for supply for the year is just 200,000 kilograms, less than a third of what could be needed. That doesn't mean that all hope is lost. Wanch says the black market will be ready to fill any gaps. As a country, we don't have a shortage of marijuana. We have a shortage of legal marijuana. Health Canada is aware getting rid of the black market will take time. In an email to CBC News, a spokesman acknowledged the shift from illicit supply to legal sources will be incremental over the first few years. Even more traditional. Just Angus Taylor expects local drug dealers will try to undercut government prices as well and worries what will happen if the supply of legal weed does run out. We're concerned perhaps about the second or the third orders when uh, the storage uh, facilities at the licensed producers start to get a bit bare. Industry watchers say a year from now there will be plenty of approved cannabis in Canada, enough to export to other countries. But during this first year, legal supply at home is far from a sure thing. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on the national, the U.S. midterms are just weeks away, and Americans will have to choose from two very different visions for their country. So tonight, we're going to kickstart our coverage with an in-depth conversation with both Republicans and Democrats. Why are the stakes so high, and why do Canadians need to pay attention to this? We'll get into all of that right after the break. It's 35 days until the midterm elections. All 435 House seats are up for grabs and 35 in the Senate. There's more scrutiny on these midterm elections than any other in recent history. We could see a major shift of power in November. At stake for all Americans in 2018 is a referendum on their president and their country. I'm Jay Shabria. I was Ohio Governor John Kasich's senior advisor. I'm Stephanie Brown James, co founder of the Collective Pact. I'm Patty Solis Doyle. I'm a Democratic strategist and a political commentator. My name is David Fromm. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic. I used to write speeches for George W. Bush. I served as a national African American vote director for the Obama 2012 campaign, and I learned the strategies needed to win elections. I've worked with Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, and Barack Obama. In elections, nothing is certain. Those who fight elections on the last battlefield usually lose the next election. What I've learned about elections is be careful about predicting them and never underestimate them.
right, so the big day is November the 6th, and here's what's happening. These are congressional elections. So right now, Republicans control both the House and the Senate, but that could change. Take a look. In the House of Representatives, all 435 seats are up for re-election. Each party will be looking for 219 seats. That's the magic number for a majority. The Republicans are well past that number currently. They hold 236 seats, but Democrats just want to eat away at that. That's possibly easier said than done. And then there's the Senate. With the 100 seats, it's so close right now. Republicans currently hold 51, Democrats 49. In this race, 35 seats are up for grabs. And the oddity of the math is that most of those are currently held by Democrats. They will have to keep all of them, plus pick up two more. Republicans will just need to hang on to what they have. And so there's the math of this. Thank you for joining us. I know we're going to be talking a lot in the next five weeks. But the, but the first thing I want to ask is, depending on you know who you listen to or what podcasts you graze, you will hear people say things like, this midterm is going to represent you know, the biggest electoral race in, in a generation. It sounds like hyperbole. It's mostly Democrats saying that. Mm -hmm. So Patty, uh, what do the midterms actually represent? Well, look, specifically, if Democrats win back the House, they get a check on the president and on his what have been very questionable and controversial policies. Um, and the most important thing they get is the power of the subpoena. They can subpoena records. They can have public hearings. And that, having worked in the Clinton White House during white, the Whitewater investigation, subpoenas can be paralyzing because you know, it, they're just time consuming. OK, so that's, that's the prize. But, but what does the test represent, David? Like, what is the meaning of these midterms? Look, historically, um, the thing that drives midterm elections is the approval of the president. And historically, the thing that drives the approval of the president is the state of the economy. What is weird about the Trump presidency is the economy is pretty good. And people think it's pretty good. When you ask them, they give the economy good marks. The country's on the right, right track. I'm better off than I was a year ago. I'm optimistic about the future. And yet the president's popularity has tumbled as if there were an economic crisis going. If there's never been so big a gap between what people think of the president and what people think of the economy. Republicans are gambling that Americans will vote the economy. Democrats are hoping that Americans will vote based on their feelings about the president. Okay, so Stephanie, is, is there a group uh, that you're looking towards that, that you think will actually make the difference here, that you think will actually make a mark in these midterms? Yeah, totally. I, I am very excited about the midterms because I think what it really represents is um, our values as a country. Do we feel that everyone is created equal, should be treated equally, which right now policies don't show that that's the case. And because you have young voters and people of color, especially who are so tied to values and how they vote, I think we will see a huge surge in voters who feel as though, you know what, change has to come. The 2016 change we saw was not a good one for us with Trump and those who were ushered in under him. And we need to have a significant change to get our country on track so that everyone is created and treated equally. Okay, Jay, your party, the Republican mm -hmm. Party, controls both the House you know, and the Senate, I'm trying to imagine how hard it's going to be for them to hang on to that because theoretically Republican voters will say, hey, I got my tax cuts and it looks like I'm going to get my Supreme Court nominees, so I'm good, tick. Yeah, so I think the two, there are two different things. The Senate's very different in terms of the math and the, the, the map than the House is. Let's talk about the House because that's probably the one that's going to flip if, if either of the two are. For me, the segment of voter that you're looking at is the, the suburban educated woman. Because a lot of those districts, there's a, there's a, those are the women that are, have been disaffected by the Republican Party. And what are they going to do this election cycle? Are they going to sit on their hands? Are they going to vote Democrat? Or are they going to come out and vote Republican? And that's where the uh, balance of power is going to lie in the, in the House of Representatives for me. Don't, don't overlook that what is also at stake in this election are governor's houses and state races. Absolutely. The Republican yes. Party now holds power at the local level to a degree that has not been seen since before the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. um, and that is um, important both... It's important in its own right, because that's where most of the decisions that affect people are made. But also, 2020 is a census year. Um, and based on the census, there is redistricting. And the United States has a very political approach to the way um, borders are drawn for congressional races. Also, the local states have a lot of influence over who is allowed to vote. Theoretically, in the United States, of course, everyone over the age of 18, except in some cases felons, practically, some states make it very difficult for people to vote. Uh, and that is also on the ballot in this election, the control of the state houses, the control of the governor's mansions. In terms of what might drive people when they do vote, I, you know, looking at these, these Supreme Court nomination hearings with Brett Kavanaugh, to what degree, Patty, do you think 
that's actually going to make a difference for people. Almost the entire nation watched those that testimony from Dr. Blasey Ford and from Judge Kavanaugh, and it had a real deep impact. And we saw it in, in, in tangible terms, in terms of the protests on Capitol Hill against Judge Kavanaugh, the two women who approached Senator Jeff Flake to please reconsider his vote, uh, the number of phone calls going into congressional offices to, you know, please don't vote for him. But does that extend to the ballot box? Well, I think what will extend to the ballot box is where it ends up. Will Judge Kavanaugh be confirmed? And if he is, I think women will pour out to the voter uh, polls in November. Jay, do you buy that? You so seem this is head. this is cutting both ways, just electorally. We can talk about the morality. We can talk about the uh, if he should be uh, confirmed. That's one thing, but it's. So the, the conventional wisdom is the suburban women that I talked about, they're going to be disaffected even more. And, that, and that's, that's very possible here. But it's, and it's hard to get Democrat enthusiasm higher because they're at all times high right now in terms of going out to the polls. What we're starting to see, and pollsters are telling me around the country, that they're starting to see an uptick of the base Republicans in terms of their intensity in this election because of they see a man that they believe is unjustly being criticized and unjustly being raked over the coals, and they want to make sure that they go to the ballot box to support him. Is there now, a if Kavanaugh that, bump be, for Republicans? Absolutely, there could be a Kavanaugh bump. And, and it's the first time we've seen this entire cycle, these uh, Republicans starting to get enthused. And that's going to be an interesting thing to play out in the midterms. One of the things that happened in the Obama years was that for the first time, white men began voting as an ethnic bloc. Um, there didn't used to be such a thing as white voters that they were they were distributed that, that mm. you know they're made up of lots of different groups that didn't like each other right. very much. But a self-conscious white and male electorate that took form in the Obama years, and that's what elected Trump, and that's what's at stake with Kavanaugh. Women, rea it's a Rorschach test right. where women have a specific reaction, but what you're also seeing is a lot of men are having a specific reaction, and so it's mutually radicalizing, not just radicalizing on one side of the ledger. And but here's the thing the about it, though: we we traditionally see Republican turnout in midterm elections um, mm -hmm. be higher than Democratic turnout. Right. You said that Democrat um, enthusiasm couldn't get any higher. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee it can. Okay. And the Democratic base was definitely spurred um, with the Kavanaugh hearings. I think we will continue to see young people, um, women, the disinfected, who I think they are very much affected, suburban white women especially, come out in support of Democrats because they are fed up of having their voices uh, shunned, being pushed to the, to, the, to the side, and they don't feel that the Republican Party offers them anything to show that they seriously believe um, in the upliftment of women. Okay, let's look at the, these two races, House and Senate. All together now, you can say it all at once. Which one matters more? House. House. House? Well, uh, a president will normally care more about keeping the Senate because the Senate confirms the president's appointees, the Senate confirms the uh, president's judges. Senate Certainly control of the Senate makes it easier to run your foreign policy the way you, you want to. Um, but I think President Trump has a special concern about the House, which is um, the House is a more cantankerous, less collegial body. Um, he has been looked at by two, two co committees, uh, intelligence committees in the House and Senate. And the Senate Intelligence Committee, it's, you know, they, they've been sort of working in a pretty functional way. It won't change that much if control changes hands. In the House, the House Intelligence Committee has been run by someone who's about the president's most important ally in concealing his Russia connection, a man named Devin Nunes. Um, and the person who would replace Devin Nunes, Nunes as chairman, a con the California congressman named Adam Schiff, is one of the people President Trump most dislikes and dreads. And so if the House flips, Adam Schiff has power over the president. Well, that's, uh, I was just going to say, and if the House flips, I mean, it, my understanding is that the House can order taxes to be released, for example. Right. Oh, well, I can't I can't wait to see <laughs> when Congresswoman Maxine Waters um, becomes the head of the Financial Services Committee, which she can have subpoena power over Trump's financial records. And so I think the House is also important, not just for the outcome of the elections, but to spur folks to the polls. We see so many new congressional um, um, folks who are running for office who are really spurring the base of voters to come out that perhaps haven't voted in midterms before. Okay, okay. very briefly, thing is, if I can, we're just we're getting to the end of this walk. I just wanted to ask you, I'm hearing you sort of salivating as Democrats about what could happen <laughs> if, if you get the House, but is there so, did Democrats not have to be careful what they wish for? Yes. Because if, if President Trump gets a result he does not like, does this not potentially lead to a situation where he says, fine, I'm going to rule by executive order? He has been ruling by executive order. He, whether it's pulling out of the Paris climate, whether it's the, the Muslim ban, he has been ruling by executive order. And sure, he will continue to rule by executive order. But he, what we're forgetting is on November 7th, the day after the midterms, is the 2020 election kicks off. And to have the 
power of the subpoena leading into the 2020 election, it really gives the Democrats an upper hand to really hold Donald Trump and his ethic problems to the fire. Okay, well, you're not there yet, but, <laughs> but Jay, if it happens... Here's, here's the thing the Democrats have to be careful of. The, right now, America is divided into the red team and the blue team. And, and I mean it, we wear this jersey and I, you wear that jersey and I hate you and I'm going to beat you. And that's just the way it is on both sides. If the Democrats go in and they win the control of the Congress and they start with some of these impeachment hearings or, or subpoenas and all of a sudden they start to overreach in the minds of a lot of the people on the red team, let's say, that could, again, swing the pendulum back for the 2020 election, too. And that's where the, I think the Democrats are going to have to be careful going into this, too. We have to take a quick break now. Uh, when we can come back, we're going to look at a piece of uh, midterm advertising that if you were looking for uh, a kindler, gentler political discourse, uh, you're not going to find it here. This is stone cold <laughs> cruel. Have a look at this. Paul Gosar is my brother. My brother. And I endorse Dr. Brill. Dr. Brill wholeheartedly endorse Dr. David Brill. So we're back with our panel of Republicans and Democrats who spent uh, a lot of time in the inner circles of power, still do. David Frum, Stephanie Brown-James, Patty Solis-Doyle, Jay Shabrai. So we are five weeks until the midterm elections. We will be hearing from you again. but. The closer it gets, the nastier it gets, obviously, right? One indication of that, uh, that it's going to be ugly, is an ad from Arizona. And again, if you are looking to a shift, uh, looking for something nicer, forget it. Th this is not that. Have a look. Paul Gosar, the congressman, isn't doing anything to help rural America. Paul's absolutely not working for his district. My name is Tim Gosar. David Gosar. Grace Gosar. Joan Gosar. Gaston Gosar. Jennifer Gosar. Paul Gosar is my brother. My brother. And I endorse Dr. Brill. Dr. Brill wholeheartedly endorse Dr. David Brill for Congress. I'm Dr. David Brill, and I approve this message. You do. <laughs> that is nasty. So aside from it being a very uncomfortable place on American Thanksgiving at the mm -hmm. Gosar home, uh, is that just clever in, in a one-off sense, or is it indicative of something else? I mean, I think the, the, the team that pulled that ad together is brilliant, and I think that it shows, look, people are tired of the status quo, even within their own families. We're not going to back you just because you're our brother. We want to have someone in, in positions of power who are putting forth policies that will actually benefit the people. And I think that this is just a very honest ad of where a lot of Americans feel. It you also bring shows up... something about the difference in Canadian and American politics. In Canada is a country in which partisan identity is a pretty light identity. Uh, very few people think being a liberal or being a conservative, maybe being a new Democrat is a little bit more an important part of who they are compared to all the other things they are. In the United States, party identity has become central to self-identification. Uh, um, and there's, there's a famous survey that in, in 1960, Americans were asked, happens to have been done then, would you care if your son or daughter married somebody from the other party? Well, 5% of Americans said they would care. And the last time the survey was done, just in the, during the Obama years, about half of Americans said they would care. Mm -hmm. um, so this is central to self-definition, and that line cuts across family lines. It's more important even than family. Okay, you talk about self-definition, but this is a big question about identity, particularly for the Democrats. And Stephanie, I'm, I'm curious. I'm not sure as an outsider, I understand what kind of creature the Democratic Party is right now. I, is it sort of the, the party of Bernie Sanders, very far to the left, a progressive social Democrats? Or is it sort of aiming for a middle of the road, Hillary, don't offend anyone kind of party? I think the party is still trying to figure it out. That's I right. think that, it, that people on, on both ends of the spectrum with regards to party ideology are trying to push it more to understanding what we are and to be more of a, an inclusive party. Um, one that is more um, focused on the middle and how can we make sure that Americans are getting the, the services that they need to be able to prosper. But look, it's, it's been real um, challenging within the party politics to be able to say that this is a party that that, rec that um, represents all Democrats. Right. So, but, I, but I think what, what um, Democrats have done very well is in each of these district races is run candidates that speak mm -hmm. to the constituency of that district. So, of course, we're going to have candidates who are much more progressive and candidates who are much more moderate. Well, you're going to have to figure it out on a... On Correct. A and on scale. November 7th, that's when the battle begins to sort of figure out the identity of our party. But right now, I think Democrats are pretty smart in sort of running individual races. This is okay. President Trump's secret weapon. If the Democrats do very well, the candidates they'll elect will pull that party quite far to the left. 
um, especially if they win the House and not the right. Senate. And that will tilt the party in a way that makes it much less electable in a national election because the presidential map looks very different from the congressional map. Right. Okay, in, two, in a sentence and a half each, which race are you going to be watching? I'm going to be watching the Arizona one for the sheer voyeuristic value of it. <laughs> Which one? Start with you, Jerry. So, so there's a race that my, my district that I grew up in, I cut my teeth. It was uh, Ohio 12. There was a special election. It was the last special election. And I'm going to be watching that race because uh, there was a lot of money poured into it and the Republicans barely held on. If we can uh, do well there, too, it, it portrays good things for us. Stephanie? I'm watching uh, the gubernatorial races in Georgia, Maryland, and Florida. Mm -hmm. We had the chance to have uh, two or three black um, um, African Americans become governors, which, to your point earlier, you know, what happens in the state is oftentimes controlled by those governors. And so I think we could see a real historical uh, shift happen. Mm -hmm. I like to go to bed early, so I will be watching the Tennessee race because it, <laughs> the Tennessee Senate race, because if the Democrats pick up that Senate seat, the Senate goes Democrat, that's uh, clearly on its way, and I can go to bed at 10. I'm going to be watching uh, the Texas Senate race. I was waiting Ted, for Texas. Ted Cruz v versus Beto O'Rourke. This Beto is someone who came out of nowhere and has captured the hearts of all Democrats. And this was not a race that should be close. So I'm looking at that one. All right. Patty Tolly Storrell, Patricia Bry, Stephanie Brown James, David Frum. You're, you're very good sports. Uh, we appreciate this very much. And I know we will be talking again. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Can't wait. Okay, meanwhile, uh, we are tracking reaction tonight to another story developing south of the border. A blockbuster New York Times report that Donald Trump and his siblings helped his parents evade taxes in the 1990s and profited greatly as a result. According to the Times, Trump received today's equivalent of at least $413 million from his father's real estate business. And he reportedly got much of that by setting up a fake corporation with his siblings to disguise millions of dollars in gifts from his parents. New York tax officials are reportedly now looking into the claims. But in a statement tonight, the White House described the Times report as a, quote, misleading attack. They say the IRS signed off on the transactions and they want the Times to apologize. Meanwhile, at a rally tonight in Mississippi, the U.S. president once again defended his Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, then mocked Christine Blasey Ford, the woman who accused Kavanaugh of sexual assault. 36 years ago, this happened. I had one beer, right? I had one beer. Well, you think it was, nope, it was one beer. Oh, good. How did you get home? I don't remember. How'd you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. I don't know. Last week, Ford told the Senate Judiciary Committee that in 1982, Kavanaugh pushed her onto a bed and groped her. She was 15 at the time. The FBI has a week to investigate before a Senate vote on Kavanaugh's nomination. And we are watching for reaction tonight from Myanmar after leader Aung San Suu Kyi became the first person to be stripped of honorary Canadian citizenship. It was made official today by the Senate. She's been accused of standing idly by as her country's military carried out a genocide against Rohingya Muslims. The moment is up next on The National and tonight it's all about rolling with the punches in Calgary. Today also happens to be our 19th wedding anniversary. And we have uh, spent the entire day shoveling snow and pushing snow off roofs, and now we're trying to save our trees. Well, here's another look at the brutal first snowstorm of the season in Calgary. Imagine waking up to this. It was record-breaking, and don't forget, we are just starting October. Boy, uh, so that's close to 40 centimeters of snow. It clogged roads, caused crashes, and just became an overall headache for the city. But Calgarians, you are a hearty bunch. And the way some of you decided to embrace what Mother Nature threw your way, well, that's our moment of the day. Coming at you from Calgary, where we've had close to 40 centimeters of snow in the last 24 hours. I got trapped in the ditch. Of course, Canadians being who they are, they pulled me out. We've been on the runway for about five hours now <laughs> in Calgary. I'm supposed to see Beyonce tonight. When you live in a city like Calgary, this is fairly normal, even though it's October. It's the best though, take advantage, go do a little snowboarding, test out the new gear. Today also happens to be our 19th wedding anniversary. 
and we have uh, spent the entire day shoveling snow and pushing snow off roofs. This is what Calgarians do when it snows too much. We go skiing. It's so, so amazing. I think it's really important to be awed by things, not just inconvenienced by them. So wise, uh, you know, good sports, firstly, but we were all very worried about that woman trying to go see the Beyonce concert. So we checked in, she made it. She stored her luggage in the airport and made a beeline to see Queen Bee. So uh, mission accomplished there. <laughs> well, you know, and, and you know, on a story like this, I, I do think there are two sides to, uh, to every story. I, on the one hand, this is a pretty, it can be a pretty dangerous situation, right? I mean, you look at the, the traffic chaos on the roads, all that snow, I mean, 40 centimeters of snow, when it's wet snow, it's heavy too, right? I mean, it can bend and break trees. I remember seeing that much snow in Montreal, entire balconies came down. But then, you know, the other side of the story is, I was following the Calgary Zoo today. Uh, they posted pictures of their pandas playing in the snow, which was just adorable to see. <laughs> I've never lived in Alberta, but I have some friends in Calgary, and I know that there's this fierce rivalry between Calgary and Edmonton. I don't know how real it is, how much of it maybe is just fun, but there was an armada of snowplows that came down the highway from Edmonton to help out. So I'm not sure how Calgarians are feeling about that tonight. Grateful, I'm sure. Just grateful. <laughs> that is the National for October the 2nd. Good night. Good night. Good night.